any declarations of interest? No, thank you. Moving on then, item three in the agenda, agenda charging for services for 2021-2022 in terms of licensing. And I presume this is going over to our legal team. Yes, uh, good morning. Morning, Joe. Joe, Joe Brammy here. Um, this is a report submitted for approval of the proposed licensing fees and charges for 2021-22. Um, it uh, alters the previous years in line with inflation and introduces one or two changes. Uh, the first change is um, a reduction in charges for wheelchair accessible vehicles. Uh, we have for many years tried to increase the numbers of these vehicles and uh, this is another uh, way of, 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 of encouraging their, their uh, licensing. So there's a, there's a very small uh, difference in the overall income for the council over the course of the year, but I think the benefits are there for the, for the public on that one. Um, the second difference is uh, we noticed an anomaly uh, in that, that we were charging uh, two rates of uh, licensing fees for certain licenses such as street traders, whereas other authorities hadn't. Um, again, when we looked into the figures, the uh, effect of that was nominal over the income uh, for the whole year. And therefore, we are in a position, we think, to introduce uh, a benefit to to those maybe trying to set out on business on their own and um, obtaining a license for street trading or, or certain other activities. So it's a bit of a boost for the public again, uh, without much of a cost to the council. So we would recommend uh, approval of that. Um, I'm happy to take any questions, but apart from that, I, I would. Uh, just ask you to approve the, the report. Okay, thanks very much for that, Joe. I um, appreciate that. This, there are a few changes in the paper in terms of our licensing, but as, as you touched on, I think most of them should be, uh, I think, hopefully uh, accepted by the public. I, I think there are areas there where we're looking to post-pandemic to help try and grow uh, businesses and support individuals. And so I think most of that uh, should be relatively positive. I think the 1.9% increase uh, ties in and the general uh, increases uh, and I would hope that uh, that will be looked at in conjunction with the areas of charges that we're removing uh, to enable that growth hopefully to occur. Happy to open it up for any questions? No? Okay, thanks then colleagues. Are we happy then to note that the, the charges for 2021-22 in accordance with the table in Appendix 1 where an increase occurs, the increases are approximately 1.9%, uh, being the rate of inflation uh, advised by the chief accountant. Uh, note the reduced charges for wheelchair accessible vehicles licenses uh, for the purpose of encouraging the increased availability of these vehicles uh, and remove the difference between business and employee rates for some of the licenses. I'll be happy to note those approve those recommendations, colleagues. Okay, thank you, much appreciated, and thanks, Joe. Thank you, Chair. Item four on the list is the debt management for non-domestic rates and sundry debt income. Uh, and I presume, Louise, are you covering this, or Alison? Sorry. I'll cover it, Leader, thanks. Um, morning, everybody. Um, this report seeks Cabinet approval for write-off of irrecoverable sums related to non-domestic rates, sundry debt income and housing benefit overpayments. Approval is also sought for council tax reduction adjustments as a result of our new council tax and benefits system implementation. You'll recall that this is a standard report which is prepared at least annually for Cabinet and we've planned for this and in all cases of write-off the sums can be met from existing bad debt provision. There's no net impact on the overall revenue accounts or the budget process as these sums have already been provided for. Cabinet should also be assured that every effort is made to recover these sums and the decision to th seek write-off isn't taken lightly or without due cause. In addition, if we have any future avenue um, becomes available by which to recover these monies, uh, today's decision does not prevent any such opportunities being pursued. So this year, the sums being recommended for write-off are broken down as follows. We have non-domestic rates arrears of up to £47,419.54. 
funded debt income of up to £50,473.61 and housing benefit overpayments of up to £45,842.90. And these sums recommended for write-off have been proposed with regard to the council's debt recovery policy, which was also approved by Cabinet. The other part of today's paper is to do with the um, implementation of the new council tax and benefits IT system. Um, this has been a significant piece of work and a big transition for our teams. And, sorry, um, and um, a significant piece of work for our teams and a big transition for them, um, pending a legacy system that we've used for many, many years. Um, to implement a change on this scale in a normal year would have been tough enough for the teams, but with the teams working at home and system suppliers working at home and with all the additional service pressures they've had around COVID, um, this has been even more of an achievement for them. It's going to take some time to bed in the new system and get the full um, business and customer benefits out, and that will be the focus of our team over the next year. So as with the changeover of any long-standing legacy system, there have been some housekeeping and levelling up issues that we've been required to do to con uh, reconcile the legacy system with the new system. So our council tax reduction calculations on the new system use a slightly different methodology from the old one, and we've had to do some system adjustments to cleanse the data prior to the annual billing, which um, we have just signed off um, for, for going live um, this week. Today's report seeks cabinet approval of adjustments of £23,958 in 2019-20 and £22,666 in 2021. So the recommendations today for cabinet are to approve the write-offs of um, the sums totalling to £143,736.05 and, and we've stated around non-domestic rates, fungi debt, uh, income and housing benefit overpayments. To approve the council tax reduction adjustments associated with the new system of um, £23,958 and £22,666. Note that we will bring back further papers later in the year about council tax arrears and non-domestic rates arrears. And note that all sums written off and adjusted for have been accounted for already, so don't affect the revenue budget uh, or the budget that is currently in place. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much for that, Louise. Much appreciated. I know a lot of work has gone into this, as it does every year, uh, in looking at our position in relation to to bad debt. Uh, it's good to note that you know that the new system is in and appears to be working well, uh, which is a positive aspect from it. And of course, uh, the, the fact that we're looking at uh, to ensure that some of our uh, residents, in terms of uh, the council tax reduction adjustments. Uh, are being suitably catered for. Happy to open it up, colleagues. Councillor Bamford. Thank you, Chair. I, I just wanted to ask about this council tax reduction, the, the differential on page 12. Is this for um, long-standing? Um, is, is this just an accounting adjustment from long-standing council ta uh, taxpayers? Or is this good? does this mean, <clears throat> or does it mean that Current council taxpayers may be having their council tax adjusted and that perhaps they were paying slightly too little um, and that they were getting a higher council tax reduction than they should have. So does that mean that some people are going to get higher council tax bills next year or this coming year? Um, yeah, there are there are some. There's a few different reasons for the different adjustments. There are some um, areas where there's it's because the change is around our, our uh, new system calculating things a bit of a bit differently from the old system. So it's a bit of levelling up round about that. Um, there are differences you can take to interpreting the legislation as well. So some of it is 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 due to that kind of issue, and. Um, there are, but there are some customers affected by it, and we will be in touch with each of the customers that are affected. So, of course, of our customers, it's, it's 374 customers are affected. Some of them buy a value of 50 pence. Um, the the greatest value is is up upwards of a thousand pounds that will be affected. But we will be talking to those customers individually. Alison, do you want to say any more about that? No, I think that that, that covers it. I mean, um, it's. It's a mix. It's a mix in there, um, so some customers will be impacted. Yeah. And those customers that are, um, it will be from now going forward that they will be asked to pay the adjusted figure. Will we be asking them for arrears? Um, I presume we can't. We wouldn't be doing that since it's our 
either miscalculation or, as you see, an, an adjustment in the way the calculation is, is carried out and interpretation of that. So we, will we be asking customers to, to, to pay back or will it just be from now going forward? We're not going to go backwards and that's really what part of this is about, is to make sure that we don't do anything retrospective, that we only um, make the, the adjustments as we move forward. So there's no retrospective adjustments um, to go through for customers. Thank you. Okay, colleagues, any other questions? No, I'd be happy. Alice, or, uh, Louise has already outlined the, the recommendations there. Are we happy then with those recommendations and to note the aspects accordingly? Okay, thank you, colleagues. Thank you. Thanks, Louise. Um, item five on our agenda is our estimated revenue budget outturn uh, as at the 31st of December 2020. And I assume Mrs. McCrossan, Margaret, good morning. <laughs> Yes, this is the first one of, uh, of my reports. Um, it's the usual revenue budget outturn, and this time it's up to period nine. So it's um, comparing expenditure and income against budget for a period to the 31st of December 2020. Uh, this is the fifth monitoring report this year, and uh, I'm pleased that it shows uh, a further improvement on the position that's been reported to Cabinet previously. Last report went up at the end of January. On the basis of uh, this latest information, we are forecasting a year-end underspend of 1.364 million, or just around half a percent of the annual budget. And uh, that's about the first time this year that we've actually forecast a net underspend. Um, the reasons for all the various departmental variances are covered in the report, but basically the position is uh, reflecting 1.1 million of unfunded COVID pressures being offset by 2.47 million of managed council underspends. Um, and the reason that uh, we're showing such an improvement since the last time is that um, the Trust have reassessed their forecast shortfall in the light of the latest information about um, opening um, openings and uh, the furlough scheme. Um, and we've also been able to make a further reduction on the assessment of council-wide PPE costs, not just the amount of PPE we need, but we've also managed to get some um, incredibly good deals through procurement um, on the PPE. In fact, they've managed to get hold of uh, some of it for free, which is fantastic. Um, so that's helping the position markedly this time round. Um, the forecast reflects the government funding that had been confirmed to address COVID pressures at the time that we wrote the report. However, as you'll know, further funding has been announced in the last few days um, to support both in the current and going into next year as well for COVID pressures. So we will factor the latest updates into the next report, which is due up. I think it's the 1st of April, it's due up our next report. Um, as you know, directors have already taken action to stop all non-essential expenditure. Um, and together with uh, the permitted fiscal flexibilities that we're getting progressively more information on, this should allow us to manage the remaining gap till the end of the year. Um, as I said, some of the fiscal flexibilities, fine tuning detail is, is still awaited and the various account treatments of that. Um, but once we get that, we'll be able to finally confirm the position. Obviously, things are still tight. We're not quite at the end of the year yet, so um, we will continue to monitor it very closely. And there'll be one more report on the financial performance, which will come up to you, as I say, on the 1st of April. So I would ask you um, to approve the, the various budget adjustments shown as usual. Note the position at the moment and uh, just ask directors to continue to do all they can to monitor and control and avoid non-essential expenditure. Thanks very much, Margaret. Much appreciated. We know how difficult it has been uh, in recent times because it's not clearly because of the, the pandemic. It's not as straightforward uh, as it once was, if you like. Um, so we know that there's additional funding is constantly coming in and indeed uh, money going out. Uh, so we very much appreciate the work by yourself, by all of the accountancy team and indeed by all of our directors 
uh, over the last few months in order to get us to this position. It is notable that we are in a very good position, uh, but clearly that is always subject to change. Uh, and we're aware that uh, a lot of that change is happening fairly regular as new announcements are made. Uh, we know we still wait on uh, the details of all of the flexibilities that might be available to us, uh, and we continue to monitor that, monitor that accordingly. Happy to open up, colleagues, for any comments. No. Uh, okay. Uh, Margaret has already outlined the recommendations. Are we happy to continue then uh, that we approve the, the, the environments uh, cert and operational adjustments as set out in the notes in the tables, pages 14 to 29, and uh, note the significant improvement in the probable outturn position? Instruct our departments to continue to avoid all non essential spending. Management action is taken to remedy any avoidable forecast overspends and that all departments continue to closely monitor their probable outturn position. Uh, and hopefully at the end of this, we will uh, be in a reasonable position going into the next year, uh, which will clearly uh, put us in a much better position uh, than we had envisaged perhaps a few months ago. Uh, are we happy to note those recommendations, colleagues? Thank you. Moving on then, I presume again, Mark, the General Fund Capital Programme and the current progress report. Yes, um, again, it's the routine um, quarterly capital update for the General Fund. And um, as I said earlier, things are changing very fast. So when I come towards the end of my report, I'll be, I'll be updating you uh, in, in the, the latest developments there. So uh, this report was... Um, uh, pulled together to give you the position as at the 31st of December, and it shows a, a slight shortfall in resource of £425,000. That's just over 1.3% of the resources, so it's well within our manageable limits. And we, we include a number of movements in the current year's capital programme that we're asking you to approve. Now, these relate, uh, as in the previous couple of reports, mainly to the timing of projects where COVID has had a significant impact on the programme. Um, in these cases, any unspent funds that we can't progress with in the current year will just be carried forward and we'll catch up and use them next year. Uh, but the report also flags up that some resources in the current year might be diverted um, just in the next few weeks to enable additional priority ventilation works to be progressed as quickly as possible in schools as we get the, the pupils beginning to return. Um, we're, we're making provision for that to happen in the next financial year. But obviously, if there's anything that's urgent we can get ahead of now, we'll do so. The report also highlights um, various additional works that were carried out as part, part of the Balgary Stone Road project. And um, a report's already gone up highlighting how these are funded from developers' contributions and transfers from roads and housing capital, just so that we can then progress as much of the beneficial schemes as possible, um, all under one umbrella, as it were. But going back to the previous report at the end of November, at that point, uh, Cabinet noted that we weren't assuming any capital receipts in the current year's general fund capital programme, because the timings of the few receipts we did have were very uncertain and they might have to be reassigned to help out under fiscal flexibilities with meeting COVID pressures either this year or next year. I'm pleased to say that just in the last couple of days, our legal and property people have really worked wonders and have managed to secure um, one of the capital receipts, our largest one, which was £1.96 million. Pounds. And they've managed to secure that um, now in this financial year. We thought that that um, would drift on into next financial year. So um, as we are looking at the grant funding that's announced to date for COVID pressures, both this year and next year, we don't yet have the full picture and we can't be sure that this is going to be enough to fully address all our COVID pressures over these two years. Um, so given that position and the fact that our general reserves 
are projected to reduce to somewhere close to the minimum prudent level, I'd recommend that this capital receipt that's just come in in the last few days is set aside and applied to meet unfunded COVID pressures. Should the final gap for these unfunded COVID pressures not need us to use all of that capital receipt, then any unused element will be made available to support the capital plan again from the 1st of April 2022. But it's just giving us a wee bit of um, added assurance since we can't be 100% certain at the moment. So I uh, apologies for that coming at you so very late, but um, the rules on the fiscal flexibilities are emerging as we speak. And uh, the latest guidance we've had on the capital receipts one um, is saying that we have to have full council approval uh, of the application of any capital receipts in the year in which the capital receipts materialise. So we're so late in the capital year. Um, I've added that to the report today and this report, as you know, will be remitted to full council on the 15th of March. So we wouldn't normally put anything up so late, but circumstances have dictated because things are moving so quickly. Um, as usual, all the detailed explanations for all the normal major movements are within the, the, the report. And I would there, therefore ask you to note the report, approve the various changes in the programme, including any prioritised ventilation works that we were able to take forward within existing resources um, at the very tail end of this financial year. And I'd also ask you to agree the additional recommendation that um, 1.96 million of capital receipts generated in the current year should be applied under fiscal flexibilities to help address unfunded COVID pressures arising this year and next, with any unspent elements being reallocated to support our capital plans from the 1st of April 2022. Okay, thanks very thanks much for that, Margaret. And again, we know that things are changing <laughs> recently almost on an hourly basis uh, as we move forward. And so we appreciate the difficulty uh, that everyone is facing bringing forward uh, these reports. That said, I think this is a very positive report. Uh, when you look at the works that have been ongoing uh, and the infrastructure that's been that, that's continued, uh, it's been quite incredible to be able to do that. Uh, and be in the position that we currently are. Happy to open it up, colleagues, for any comments? No. Nope. On that basis then, uh, as Margaret has outlined, there's an additional uh, recommendation. Uh, so we're happy to note the report uh, and approve the changes within the programme, including the prioritised ventilation works, uh, which are very much uh, required. Uh, but as well as that, uh, agreeing the additional recommendation that the 1.96 million of capital receipts generated in the current year should be applied under fiscal flexibility powers to help address the anticipated unfunded COVID pressures arising in 2020-21 and 21-22, uh, with any unspent elements being reallocated to support the Council's capital plans from the 1st of April 2022. Uh, I think that's probably the, the most prudent way uh, in acknowledging uh, the receipt that we've received uh, for just under two million. Uh, but equally, that allows us still to anticipate mm -hmm. any additional COVID uh, funding uh, monies that may come our way or any additional flexibilities that we have in moving forward. So it certainly seems the most prudent way uh, to manage that. Are we happy then, colleagues, to note those recommendations? Well, nod. Agreed. Thank you. Thanks very much. And thanks again, Margaret. Moving on then, item seven uh, on the agenda is the Housing Capital Programme for 2020-21. I assume, Mr Dawes? No, I'm Not sure to see again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it is. <laughs> yeah, last one before I hand over to Barbara. Um, this one, I'm glad to say, is a wee bit more straightforward. It's your routine housing capital quarterly update uh, on the capital programme. Again, to the end of December, the short form resources is 135,000, just under 2%, and again, well within our limits. The various movements in the programme that you've been asked to approve are, are set out, but as you would expect, again, they relate mainly to timing delays due to the significant impact of COVID on both the existing and our new build housing projects. 
and all the all the details are in the report. So I'd ask you to note the report and approve the transfers and movements within the programme. Okay, thanks very much, Mara. A much more straightforward <laughs> one. Any comments, colleagues? No. Okay, thank you. I'll be happy then to note the recommendations in the report. Okay, thank you. Moving on then, item. Eight on the agenda is the trading under best value and Barbara. Uh, under the Local Government in Scotland Act 2003, the Council is required to consider its trading operations and on an annual basis determine those which should be regarded as significant. This report reviews the activities for the financial year 2020-21. To be classed as significant, the trading operations can only apply to external trading and to those activities that are not statutory. In addition, the services have to be provided in a competitive environment and the recharge has to be on a basis other than a straightforward recharge of cost. In reviewing an operations cl classifications, further tests of significance require to be taken into account using financial and non-financial criteria. Having considered these conditions, the result of the review is that in line with last year, the Council has no significant trading operations in the current year. The Cabinet is invited to approve the position for 2021. Okay, thanks very much, Barbara. Happy to open it up for any comments, colleagues? Okay, once again, thanks very much, Barbara, for this. Uh, I know it, it does take time to go through all of these. And I, I suppose looking at the fact that we are looking at ways to generate income, it may in future change. But as of as of the current circumstances, I'll be happy to report that the Cabinet is requested to approve that there are no trading services operated by the Council that should be classified as significant. Okay. Thank you, colleagues. Thank Item you. nine on our agenda is the authorisation to sign leases on behalf of the Council for the let of houses uh, and increasing the number of signatories uh, that we have in a position to be able to do that. I assume Mr Dawes. Um, thank you, Leader. This is hopefully a fairly straightforward report. Um, any individual that is granted a council tenancy is provided with an agreement which needs to be signed by an officer of the council. The number of council officers that can sign the lease is restricted. Um, the proposal is to increase the number of council staff that can sign the lease on behalf of the council for a temporary period, this is because we have a limited number of staff in the office due to COVID social distancing restrictions. The proposal, therefore, is that the additional staff are only permitted to sign the tenancy agreements for the duration of the COVID lockdown. And once we return to the office, then we will revert back to the previous number of people that were permitted to sign the lease. And as such, I'm happy to recommend this report to Cabinet. OK, thanks very much, uh, Phil, for that. Happy to open it up, colleagues. No, I think it is. It's a sensible way forward, uh, given the current circumstances and ensures that we are still able uh, to carry out our duties uh, as, a, as a local authority and ensure uh, that we do implement those and that we get our houses leased as quickly and as effectively as possible. Uh, so I think this is a, a reasonable step, given the current circumstances. Are we happy, colleagues, to then recommend that they approve the addition of the following officers uh, to the list of those already authorised to sign tenancy agreements for the letter houses. They are the repairs delivery manager, the assistant repairs delivery manager, the lead officer for strategy improvement and support, and the lead officer for property and capital. I'd be happy to note those temporary changes. Okay, thanks very much, colleagues. Item 10 on the report is a climate change strategy and action plan update. And again, Mr. Dawes, I assume. Thank you, Leader. Um, I would like to speak to this paper in a little more detail than I addressed the last one. Um, this paper outlines our proposed actions in 2021 to prepare a platform for addressing what we need to undertake in relation to climate change. Um, climate change is the most important issue that the Council will face in the next five to ten years, and it is important that we act now. Um, I appreciate that when we see timescales such as 2040 and 2045, there may be a tendency to think that this is something that we can address in the future, but the decisions we take now will have an impact for 
many, many years. And therefore, as I say, it's important that we act now. As a local authority, there are a lot of actions that we can and need to take. For example, we have 160 vehicles in the council's fleet. We need to consider how we can transfer those vehicles to being clean, how we can put in place the necessary arrangements to charge those vehicles. In relation to roads and, roads and transportation, we need to think about a network for charging vehicles across the authority. We need to think about cycling. We need to consider how we build our schools in the future. Designs will need to change in order to ensure our schools are energy efficient. We need to consider the planning process, how we give approval for um, the building of new housing. We need to consider as a local authority how we use our own buildings and the greenhouse gases that they emit. We need to think about the council houses that we will build in the future, ensure they are carbon neutral as well. As a local authority, most local authorities are perhaps only responsible for around two to five percent of the greenhouse gas emissions within their borders. However, we have a much larger role to play in both leading by example, but also putting in putting in place the infrastructure that will that will permit our local residents to switch, for example, a network of um, charging point for electric vehicles. As such, this report has three component parts. The first thing we need to do, if we wish to get to zero, we need to establish where we are now. We need to establish what our greenhouse gases are as a local authority at the moment. And paragraphs 13 to 15 detail how we plan to address that by employing a consultant so we can establish what our greenhouse gas emissions are at the moment. Like many local authorities, we need to confirm our balance in order we can, we can begin that process to get to zero. The second part of the paper, which is addressed at paragraph 16 to 18, looks at the concept of carbon budgeting. And paragraph 18 gives an example of what we mean by that. And for example, if we were to build a new school, we would need to consider the carbon emissions of that school. If the carbon emissions of that school were felt to be too high, we would need to consider either A, how we can offset it with a redesign of the school, or B, whether we can look at an offset through another means elsewhere. Paragraph 19 onward is proposing a series of workshops with the council officers asking the question, what does good look like in the future? If I go back to the list of examples I gave previously in relation to fleet, in relation to transport, in relation to planning, the purpose of the exercise is for us to ask ourselves, what do we think we need to change and how do we need to change in the future? These questions are not necessarily easy to answer. There is likely to be a resource implication both in answering these questions and also obtaining and providing the infrastructure that we need in order to implement it. If I was to give an example, we are currently looking at um, building council houses that are carbon neutral. There is a potential additional cost of around £20,000 per unit in order to build a house to that necessary standard. So there is a cost implication to this work in the future. There is not a cost implication associated with this paper, but I did wish to flag up to members that there are likely to be cost implications in the, in the future. I do appreciate it's a very complicated subject matter. And as such, the paper also proposes a separate session for members, an information session, a briefing session where members can learn more and ask questions about this issue. And this is currently being proposed for the 1st of April at 3 p.m. So I'm delighted to recommend this report to Cabinet. I'm also happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much, Phil. And I would agree this is a very important document. Uh, and, you know, I think we've all got to be uh, more uh, than aware of that because going forward it is going to play a significant part in, in everything that we do. And I think the bulk of that work is going to lie initially with the Environment Department and ensuring that we try and achieve those carbon neutral figures. And of course, there will be a cost to that. Some of that may be funded, some of it may not. Um, and they are all issues that we have going forward. I think it's also important that as a council, we start addressing these issues. And with COP26 uh, going to be uh, on our doorstep uh, later this year, then it, it 
puts us in a strong position uh, to be significantly involved in that. I know that through the city deal, we're already looking at a number of areas uh, in terms of the, the, the green agenda and in terms of the climate issues and how we manage the projects that are, only, that are there uh, and how we take them forward, but equally moving forward uh, to achieve the overall outcomes that we all want to see in terms of uh, a carbon reduction. Number of hands up uh, for folk to come in. Uh, Caroline, I think yours was up first. Thank you, Chair, and thanks, Phil, and I'll welcome the briefing session. We'll look forward to that and I appreciate the extra cost. Um, of, you mentioned about the £20,000 as an example per house, but I think the cost of not doing it is not only immeasurable, but catastrophic, isn't it? Um, can I just ask, I'm assuming the consultant that you're talking, the specialist consultant, I'm presuming that is to do work that the climate change officer we have appointed in the council i'm presuming that's to do different work or to alongside uh, to, to work alongside our climate change officer um, for a period of time that's correct yes this is a specialist piece of work for which one requires a um, specialist skill set so the individual will be working alongside the climate officer as you say thank you Councillor Kane. Thank you very much. No, I think just to welcome the paper and the progress. Uh, I mean, I think it's we all know the scale of the challenge and we all know that this is um, an emergency and it is a defining issue, um, not only for, for ourselves, but for the generations that will come after us as well. So dealing with these issues using the powers we have and the influence over over the local authority is, is so important and i think you know what i'm pleased to see is that this kind of dedicated plan of action uh, and moving tangible uh, you know tangible pieces of work forward because it's all well and good to declare that there's a climate emergency but it's about what you do after that mm. um, and i think we are all aware as i say of the situation but what we want to see is action on the ground to look at how we deal with things like our new buildings, like fleet that we, we currently have control over, how we do things in terms of waste collection, recycling, all these issues being looked at, I think is important. And we need to ensure that we make the investment uh, in the right skills and expertise in order to help officers who are currently uh, doing their day job to, to think more clearly about how um, they contribute to reducing our carbon footprint and, and, and improving climate change. So I, I think I just want to welcome the paper and um, I think we look forward to seeing the, the development of the work as it goes forward. And I think the other thing you mentioned it as well, Elidar, is um, COP26 being on our doorstep in terms of November and I think we should lead by example as, as uh, an authority that's, that's close to that uh, important conference. And also, I'm just really keen to see what we can do through education and education team um, to ensure that young people can be engaged in all of this work, but indeed uh, in COP26 when it comes to Glasgow. And I know that there will be uh, various opportunities through the United Nations to do that. So just really keen to see yeah. that on the yeah. record today as well. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Kane. Councillor Merrick? Thanks, Adrian, and thanks for the paper, Phil. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's very encouraging to see that we're actually getting a plan to do stuff about what is the biggest emergency facing us all and, and more particularly the generations to follow. And it's, I think we all know now for sure that if we don't do anything uh, soon, we're not going to meet the time skills. You're talking about the long time skills there, Phil, that are uh, kind of put people off thinking that it's going to happen way in the future, but it's not. It's already started happening now. We turn the telly on every night and we can see the effects of climate change. It just so happens that Scotland is in one of the best places on the planet for uh, for less for less damage from climate change, but that's just luck. You know, sometimes we complain about our weather here, but it's protected us a bit. But even here, we see the the problems with climate change. Uh, I wondered a couple of things. So you mentioned about and uh, I welcome. Also, the 1st of April, that sounds brilliant that we get a session there. We could probably sit and talk for days at that just to get a, a general overview of this subject, but um, that's very welcome. You mentioned, Phil, that it's only 2.5% of the carbon 
within the council is caused by council activity. What about the other 97.5%? And what about partnership working? Uh, uh, how can we affect that? And you, you did mention about electric vehicles. I've heard a school of thought that says electric vehicles aren't necessarily the best way to avoid climate change or environmental damage, but there's all these kind of things to go into as well. It's an incredibly complex subject. Okay. So <laughs> just about partnership work, you know, if there's any of that in the plan, and uh, or, or will that develop as we go through? Okay, bring, Bill, you want to answer some of those points, then I'll bring in Councillor Lafferty. Yeah, just for clarification, I perhaps said it too quickly, it's between 2 and 5% for local authority impact, right. as opposed to 2.5%, I perhaps said it too quickly. Um, obviously, there are the emissions that we have, and there are the emissions that the residents in the council area and the businesses in the council area have. What we're proposing to do at the moment in 2021 is focus on the council's impact because obviously we need to take this one bit at a time so for 2021 we need to look at the council's emissions but one of the reasons that a local authority is so important is even though we may not for example council residents on a mixed tenure estate living in flatted accommodation the emissions from their vehicles will come from themselves they're not council emission emissions but they require us to enable them to put in the charging regime, etc., because you can't do that as an individual if you live in a mixed tenure estate. So there's a role for there's a role for us to play in relation to our residents. There also is a role for us to play in the way we plan our private housing estates, the way we plan our town centres, and the way we work with local businesses. You are quite correct, Councillor Merrick, in terms of there is a conversation taking place in terms of to what degree are electric vehicles helpful or to what degree do they present one replace one problem with a different problem and that is why it's very important when we are asking the question what does good look like that we ask the right questions and that also we have the expertise to answer those questions correctly because is that balance to be struck between yes we need to act quickly but we also need to act wisely and sometimes acting wisely requires us to take stock, obtain additional information, so we ensure that the decisions we take are informed. And we don't necessarily always have that expertise in-house. That's why when I mentioned in relation to posing the questions and answering them, there may be a resource in, in, implication for us. So it, there is that balance between acting now because there is an emergency, but acting wisely. So, and I think your point about electric vehicles is a good example in terms of sometimes the solutions need to be finessed and we need to critique them before we implement them. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that, Phil. Thanks, Phil. And Councillor Lafferty. Uh, you're still on mute, Alan. It's you. No, I'm, I'm you know, I'm on my live and kicking. It's actually <laughs> Uh, uh, extremely gratifying to see the, the work produced by the Environment Department and uh, the comments of colleagues. I think if we were to talk to the public just now, it would still be COVID would be the major in, uh, pressure facing us as a community. However, as, uh, hopefully as the COVID-19 uh, challenge decreases, there will certainly be more concern about the environment and the, the future. I must say I'm extremely gratified to see the quality of the report from Mr. Dollars and his colleagues and also the response to that by the administration councillors. I'm sure we can look, further reports will be necessary and will come before us as uh, in the council. And, uh, it is gratifying that uh, well, there is positive, a uh, positive attitude to the challenge from the administration. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Lafferty. And, and I think you're right. I mean, people will be looking at COVID uh, and the concerns around that. But clearly, I think what we're, what we're also seeing is that the, the, the lockdown has clearly had an impact on carbon output uh, because people have been uh, either doing more walking, more cycling. There's not been as many cars on the road for as long a period of time. Uh, so that has had a positive impact. And there may be some of the things that uh, we will need to look at moving forward. 
Uh, and again, some of the positives perhaps that can be taken from the pandemic and that it has highlighted these issues all the more. Uh, and we can start moving forward uh, with those uh, relatively straightforward aspects, whether that be the encouragement of more walking and cycling uh, and, and different forms of travel uh, moving forward. Very much as everyone else has done, welcome the report. I think there was just only a couple of things that we touched on. I think it is worthwhile having a member session uh, in terms of one of our sessions, perhaps pre-council, uh, to go over the issues and allow everyone to come up to speed to some extent with it and to put their thoughts on the table uh, and how we start to move forward. So I think that will be certainly a useful uh, addendum. I think one of the other things that we may need to look at, uh, and maybe I'll be for discussion at that uh, said session, would be having, we have impact assessments uh, for a host of different areas. And I think we're also going to be at the stage, uh, particularly with a lot of the infrastructure works that we have moving forward, um, that we look at a climate change impact assessment and how we actually manage that going forward so that we're factoring in costs uh, at the planning stage, uh, if you like, to ensure uh, that we try and meet those carbon neutral targets. Uh, so I think it would be worthwhile that we have an impact assessment in terms of climate change and factor that into everything that we do, as we do with the other assessments uh, that we take forward. Um, okay, folks, uh, if there are no other comments, happy to then take the report. I'll be happy that we note the requirement to establish accurate baseline data uh, for the Council's greenhouse gas emissions and a robust system of measurement in order to track that progress. Uh, we explored the use of carbon budgeting as a key instrument for driving better environmental performance and that the use of what good looks like as a framework for the development of a climate change strategy and action plan and that we factor in the additional aspects of the, the members, all members sessions and we look at uh, the possibility of an impact assessment in relation to climate change going forward if we're happy with that. Are we happy to agree, agree those colleagues? Thank you, and thanks again, Mr. Lewis, much appreciated. Item 11, uh, colleagues, is the Creek for Plainfields and the Least by St. Caddox Youth Club. And I see Andy, you <laughs> appeared. Thanks very much, Rudolph. Thanks. Um, I'm asking today, really today, I'm just advising you on a request from St. Caddox Youth Club to lease an area of the council owned Creek for Plainfields to them. Um, I'm not asking for a decision, I'm asking really that the Cabinet just note the proposal, and I suppose in many ways a proven principle, that a 25-year lease be granted to the Crook for, to the St Caddox Youth Club of the Crook for playing fields. And the reason I'm saying that is that the, legally we're required to advertise the proposal, um, and in due course bring back a further report to the Cabinet advising about the terms of any objections, if any, that have been received in response to the advert. And um, given Purda and all that sort of stuff, I wouldn't expect it. I wouldn't be putting this advert out before the election anyway. And paragraphs three, um, it's a lot of detail in the report. I'll try and just focus on what I see has been the, the key points. Paragraphs three to four and paragraphs three, four and five set out some of the background about the large clubs in the council, the large football clubs in the council area and previous financial assistance that we've given to two of them. Um, so basically the club, St Caddox, recently approached the council asking to seek that, to, seeking to lease that piece of land at Crook for playing fields because they want to develop a home ground. Um, there's some background there that the old pavilion and changing room was demolished and the new pavilion and changing rooms were then constructed and the new changing rooms service the associated let of the two grass pitches, which is the area that Crook for playing that the club are interested in. <clears throat> Needless to say, the request for St Caddox from St Caddox was received after we'd done the stuff to the new changing rooms. What they're proposing is to take on responsibility for operating and maintaining the two existing grass pitches with a view to developing at their own expense and subject to planning permission that they would still have to get. They want to build two artificial pitches and associated changing facilities over a period of time. Given the costs involved, I would expect that's going to be quite a, 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 quite a length of time. 
And obviously it depends on the club's ability to raise resources and how they would fund a sustainable business model and phase it. What I'm suggesting is that if this proposal is to proceed, that we ask them <coughs> to sign up for a 25 year lease. I'm also proposing um, and there's a longer term issue in here about who operates football lets on behalf of the council, and I've been talking to the trust about that anyway. Um, currently, the environment department lets out the changing rooms and the pitches, but what I'm suggesting is that as part of this process, all of that would um, I'd transfer that to East Renfrewshire Culture and Leisure Trust, which should help compensate for any potential income stream losses from any other areas that they might be concerned about. For example, the income that they currently get from the from the club for letting out or renting out the pitch at Eastwood High School, but I consider that to be unlikely. I would also suggest that, in my view, the changing rooms at Crookford would be rented to St Caddox for a substantial period of that 25 year period, because there's a lot of money if you think about it, in trying to build two artificial pitches and a new set of changing rooms. So I would suggest that they were probably interested in renting from us as they currently do um, the, the current changing rooms and focusing on trying to build the new pitches. Um, this time is slightly different from some of the other clubs where we've had a relationship that there's no payback element in relation to a school where they get the school gets used to the pitch or whatever sort of thing. Um, so on that basis, I'm not proposing any financial contribution towards the club from the council. It's different in terms of Barhead, for example, where the school gets use of the pitch. Checked out the titles. There's nothing that prohibits the ground being used for recreational purposes. But as I pointed out at the start, we do need to advertise the proposed disposal of the land, which is what in technical terms or legal terms, a 25 year lease constitutes disposal of the land. Um, I've also highlighted to the club that they need to be aware that whilst the proposal is welcome, I think in terms of the council's wider strategy for these types of clubs and community use and all the rest of it, that they will have to go through the planning process with regard to flood lighting and associated facilities that we know are a, are a, a potential issue in some of these types of things. Um, they also have confirmed their own community credentials, if I could put it like that, and their commitment to do. They've got uh, developing a community outreach plan, which includes disability football and preschool football, um, and even walking football for the elderly. So there's definitely like a, a big community interest in it. I suppose one of the considerations as well is if you try to look at this from a best value or value for money point of view, and if you look at paragraph 19, I've highlighted some of the things that would be relevant there. I think that just quickly going through them, current cost of maintaining and preparing those pitches is about 13,000 a year. Annual income from the pitch is around 4,200. I think um, significantly more income would be generated through the rental of the changing rooms to St Caddox Youth Club than would have been the case with us just continuing to act. The Environment Department as an agent for the leasing of the pitches. We no longer be required to maintain the grounds within the delineated area. And as I said already, that's what's slightly different between some of the arrangements between the other clubs is that there's no capital or revenue contribution being required from the council. So in terms of best value, I think you have to take all of those things into account before arriving at a conclusion. I've also suggested that um, we keep under review any potential income impact upon the trust through the loss of any <clears throat> other facilities that the St Caddox Club currently rent. However, I don't think that's an issue and I think that's something that I can comfortably manage within the context of just having dialogue, constant dialogue with the chief executive of the Leisure Trust. However, I have said that should there be a revenue impact, then clearly we would have to review the situation and come back to the cabinet. Um, so subject to cabinet approval, I'm proposing that after the election we put out the public advert. Um, 
I really I don't think there's much more really that I could say. I don't think there's any other um, issues in terms of staffing, legal IT or equalities. And basically the rest, <coughs> as I said, this accords with the Council's East Renfrewshire playing pitch strategy and action plan that was approved in 2018 and um, the trust operate to. So I think there's an opportunity here to offset potential revenue costs, but also really importantly, I think to enhance local sports provision through what to me here is clearly part partnership working with a local club. Um, <clears throat> and I think that currently the environment department really just acts as a letting agent for some changing rooms and a couple of grass pitches, but a community club such as St Caddox, if you think about it in terms of a wider sports strategy, um, could add absolutely significant value, more value in, and just improved inclusive, inclusivity through operating a local facility based around their extensive roots in the local community. Um, so really that's it in conclusion. So that's me, I'm asking you to note the proposal to grant a 25 year lease that I'll advertise it. And if there are any objections, I'll bring them back to the cabinet to consider and resolve. So thank you. OK, thanks very much uh, for that, Andy. Uh, very uh, concise report uh, in terms of uh, what we're looking for. Um, I think we all know, colleagues, we're extremely fortunate in East Renfrewshire that we do have um, three quality clubs that deliver uh, health and well-being uh, for all of our children and uh, many adults uh, as well. And I think that's a testament to the area that we have. But we equally know that the pressure on the pitches uh, that we have across the authority, and they are uh, numerous, is extremely tight. And we would obviously encourage it, the community uh, to take ownership in many respects uh, when and where they can in order to ensure that those clubs can continue to grow and provide those services. Councillor Bamford. Thanks, Chair. I think most local people um, would welcome the improving of, uh, improvement of these fields, um, which uh, already exist and we know are limited in use throughout the year because of various uh, conditions, including the weather. I, I, what I want to ask is on the um, delineated area, it looks like it's a whole of Crookfer Park as opposed to just a playing field, uh, sorry, just the, the two football pitches. Can you confirm that it, it will be the whole of Crookford Park or if it is just the pitches that will be included in any, or is that something that will be um, clarified later on in any negotiations that go forward? I can bear it in mind, but as far as I've got Andy Corey on hand here with regard to the detail, but the map attached shows, shows the potential area that they have requested, which for me looks like the majority of Crookford Park. It's, and that's what they've requested. So I don't know if I could bring Andy in if that might help. Yeah, it's all subject to the lease, Andy. So uh, when it comes back from public consultation, we'll take into account anything that comes out of that. Um, it, it's not in set in stone that they would take over that whole delineated area. Obviously, there's there's walking and exercise space in between times. So that's something that can be negotiated as part of the lease with St Caddox. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Any other comments, colleagues? Councillor Kane. I'd like just to thank Andy for the paper and the detailed piece of work that's been done so far. I think you know we have been asked to uh, agree to now put this publicly to consultation, which I think is the right thing to do. We have a very strong sense from St Caddox Youth Club uh, how they want to move this forward for the good of the, the wider community. I think that's strongly supported by the parents and, and young people who benefit from St Caddox, uh, the vast majority of whom live in the East Ramshire area. So, you know, we're going to hear a very strong uh, representation from them, but absolutely right that we also hear from our, our wider community as well. Uh, and then we can consider all of those options and, and, and move this forward. So um, just, I think, to support the, the way forward. OK, thanks, Councillor Kane. Yeah, don't see any other hands. Yeah, I think this is a very welcome report. I know it's been uh, there's been discussions ongoing for some time, uh, so I very much look forward to moving it forward. Are we happy then, colleagues, uh, with the recommendations to the Cabinet, which is to note the proposal to grant a 25-year lease 
uh, of an area of truck for playing fields to St Carroll's Youth Club and requests that the Director of Environment undertake the necessary advertisement processes in respect of such a proposal and in due course bring a further report to Cabinet advising of the terms of any objections received in response to the advertisement. Thank you, colleagues. That's approved. Item 12 on the agenda are the proposals for changes for non-statutory planning services. And Gillian, if you're here to do that. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, what we're proposing here is the introduction of um, fees for our non-statutory planning services. Now, obviously, almost every planning application that's submitted has a fee attached to it, but there is a lot of work goes on on other aspects of the planning process where we don't we don't charge fees and um, we can charge fees but up to this point in time we've chosen not to do that um, so on an average year the council gets about 900 plus planning applications a year and in 1920 on top of that 900 plus planning applications we received 433 requests for written pre-application inquiries now, they can range from a single story extension up to pre-application comments on um, 300 houses being built in Maidenhill. So, it's a, you know, some of them can be very lengthy and detailed um, and they take up a lot of resources. So, what we're proposing is to introduce charging, which would be um, the, the scale of the fees would be relevant to the, the size of the development. So, a single story House extension, we would propose, for example, somewhere in the region of £50 for pre-application service. And if you consider that cost in terms of, you know, a conservatory would cost you £20 to £20,000 to build. Um, a single story extension can cost between £40 and £60,000. So in the grand scheme of somebody's extension proposal, um, £50 to £75 is not a significant amount. So what we're proposing in terms of the non-statutory, uh, when I talk about non-statutory um, services, that would be for pre-application discussions. It would be for non-material variations, which is when people come in for small scale changes to their approved planning permission. Um, fees for submitting paper planning applications and also the streets naming and numbering service, which is almost exclusively to the house building industry um, and again to which we, we um, provide that free of charge. Um, so you will see on um, appendix one on 123, page 123, there is a kind of sliding scale of fees in relation to householder development, local developments, local developments, new housing, major developments and exemptions where we would propose an exemption. Um, we're also proposing an exemption for um, the fee for submitting paper planning applications and there would be an exemption there for people who were not able to use um, the national portal to submit planning applications digitally. So our recommendation um, is to allow the planning application process um, and to bring in additional income for the council. Okay, thanks for that, Gillian. Happy to open it up for any comments. Councillor Kane. Thanks, um, Chair. Gillian, just it's been a while since I've sat on a planning committee, so um, reminds me, you know, pre-planning advice isn't it isn't statutory. You don't you don't have to take up pre-planning advice. I guess it's, it's it's optional as a a prospective applicant whether they'd be do that or not. Yeah. Yes, it is optional. Um, we do actively encourage pre-application discussions because it quickens the process and people get a better service if they engage with us. So there is a there is a a fine line between encouraging people to engage with us and charging for that service, which is why, you know, we think the fees that we're proposing in terms of the overall bill costs are, you know, quite small. Sure. No, thank you for that clarification. Yeah. Okay, thanks for that. Any other comments? 
No, I think this is a, a positive way forward, Gillian. I know that you know that even nationally there's been a number of discussions ongoing about the, the cost of planning and whether there should be full cost recovery, et cetera, particularly for major applications, uh, because the amount of work that our planning officers do is significant. And clearly, uh, quite often, the costs in no way meet uh, the amount of work that has to go in uh, to ensuring that the process is carried out properly. Uh, so I think in general, we would all be uh, fairly comfortable with uh, the charges that you've outlined. On that note then, colleagues, are we happy with the recommendations that are put to us? Uh, they are that the charges uh, subject to the rates and conditions contained in the report come into effect from the 1st of April. The provision of pre-application planning advice uh, and charges in Appendix 1 and Table 1, the processing of non-material variations, an administration charge for handling applications submitted in the paper rather than online, and an administration charge for providing the street naming and numbering service, uh, again, which is largely to the development industry. And of course, there are some exemptions there uh, that we would be noted as well. Are we happy then with those recommendations, colleagues? Okay, thank you. And thanks, Gillian, for that. Item 13, colleagues, we're almost there. Uh, write off of irrecoverable former tenant rents and court expenses. And actually, Mr. Dawes, you appear again. <laughs> Thank you, Leader. I was a longer promise. Um, the purpose of this report is to seek approval to write off former tenant rent and court expenses that can't be recovered through the debt collection process. Um, this is a report which comes to Cabinet each year. Paragraph two details the total sum of just over £190,000 that is seeking to be written off, £165,000 of that in relation to the housing revenue account, and £25,000 of that against the non-housing revenue account accrued by homeless households. Paragraph three details the circumstances in which um, debt is written off, um, debt over two years of age, where the debt recovery process has been exhausted, small balances of under 75 pounds, where the debtor is deceased and has left no estate, or where the debtor is in care of nursing home and there's no likelihood of the debt being settled. Um, provision is made each year for this fact, so there are no um, financial consequences associated with this paper as provision is made. As such, I'm happy to recommend this report to Cabinet and obviously has to take any questions. Thank you. OK, thanks very much, Phil. Happy to open it up for any questions or comments. Nope. Again, uh, we all know the circumstances in relation to these reports on an annual basis uh, and every effort is made during that course of time to recover all of the funds that are due and that these write-offs are only when we have exhausted that process. So on that note, colleagues, are we happy to note the recommendations uh, which are approved the write-off sum up to the value of 190,267.67 pence of former tenant irrecoverable rents and court expenses uh, whilst acknowledging that these can be pursued and recovered in the future should additional information or opportunities arise. Uh, note that £165,087.27 of this amount is written off against the housing revenue account and the remaining £25,182.40 is written off against the non-HRA account as this was accrued by homeless households placed in temporary accommodation. And note the right off that these historic unrecoverable debts will have no net impact on the council's accounts as provision has been made for the debt in full in previous years. I'll be happy to note those recommendations, colleagues. Thank you. Thanks very much, colleagues. It's been a busy agenda this morning. Uh, but before we finish up, uh, can I just uh, thank uh, Mr. Paul O'Neill. Uh, for his services, uh, not only this morning, but over several years to the council. Uh, I know that, uh, like me, you'll probably be surprised that Paul is retiring because he certainly doesn't look old enough. Uh, so, but I'd be of all on numerous occasions uh, called on Paul for advice uh, and to cover the services that they have provided over the years to the council, of which I'm sure most of us are all extremely grateful. Uh, so can I thank Paul for his years of dedicated service and wish him all the best for the future. Uh, now that he's able to go and no doubt play more golf than he has been able to in recent times. Uh, 
Uh, so thanks very much, and I'm sure everyone uh, would agree to Paul uh, for your years of service. And I know you've still got uh, some time left yet and a few more meetings to cover, uh, but I understand this is your last cabinet meeting. Uh, and once again, thanks very much and all the best in your retirement. Thanks very much, Lena. I appreciate the kind words. Okay, thank you everyone else uh, for your time this morning. That concludes our agenda and uh, thanks to all.